Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealthclub.org, see our videos on YouTube, and catch up with us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm John Boland, president of KQED Public Media, member of the Commonwealth Club Board of Governors, and your moderator for today's program. Our discussion today is stimulated by a documentary film soon to air on PBS stations across the country entitled Rikers and American Jail. You can also see the documentary online at rikersfilm.org. The focus of the film in our discussion is the human toll of mass incarceration in America, particularly in our jails. I'm now pleased to introduce our distinguished panel. Bill Moyers, executive editor of Rikers and American Jail, has been a broadcast journalist for more than four decades, earning more than 30 Emmys and many other distinguished awards. With his wife and creative partner, Judith Davidson Moyers, he has produced such groundbreaking public affairs series as Now with Bill Moyers, Bill Moyers Journal, and Moyers and Company. Mr. Moyers was a founding organizer and deputy director of the Peace Corps and special assistant to President Lyndon B. Johnson. He also served as Johnson's press secretary. Bill's journalistic career includes being publisher of Newsday, senior correspondent for the distinguished documentary series, CBS Reports, and later a senior news analyst for CBS Evening News. He has also been honored with the National Academy of Art, Television Arts and Sciences Lifetime Achievement Award. He currently serves as president of the Schumann Media Center, a nonprofit organization that supports independent journalism. Retired Superior Court Judge LaDoris Cordell was the first African-American woman appointed to the bench in Northern California and is the former independent police auditor for the city of San Jose. During her five-year term, the former judge was praised for bringing unprecedented accountability to the San Jose Police Department. Judge Cordell graduated from Stanford Law School and established herself as the first lawyer to open a private practice in East Palo Alto, California, a largely African-American and Mexican community. In 1982, Governor Jerry Brown appointed her to the Municipal Court of Santa Clara County, and six years later, she won a seat on the county Superior Court. Judge Cordell retired from the bench to serve eight years as vice provost and special counselor to the president of Stanford. Lenore Anderson is a founder and executive director of Californians for Safety and Justice, a nonprofit organization working to replace prison and justice system waste with solutions that create safe neighborhoods and save public dollars. She's also president of the Alliance for Safety and Justice. Ms. Anderson was also co-author and campaign chair of Proposition 47, a California ballot initiative passed by voters in 2014 that is projected to reduce incarceration and reallocate funds into mental health, drug treatment, K through 12 programs, and victim services. Ms. Anderson previously served as director of the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, Chief of the Alternative Programs Division of the San Francisco District Attorney's Office and Director of Public Safety for the Oakland Mayor. She holds a degree from New York University. Please welcome our panelists. As I mentioned earlier, the catalyst for our conversation is the new documentary about the notorious Rikers Island Jail in New York City. But this is an issue that affects every jurisdiction in the nation. And there's a fair amount of confusion, starting with the definition of a jail. So let's start by asking Judge Cordell the difference between a jail and a prison and how one ends up in jail. So I, I really get irritated when I hear commentators interchange prison and jail when they're talking about a particular case because a, they're very distinct. A jail is a facility to confine people that is run by local law enforcement agencies. So in California, the jails are run by sheriffs. Prisons are run by the state, and they are not local. They're generally way out, where it takes quite a bit of time to get there. Jails basically have two purposes. One is to confine people who are awaiting trial, and that is because either they have been denied bail by a judge, or because they're not able to post bail. They are presumed to be innocent, they are awaiting trial. And the other is that people are confined who have been convicted 
and are now serving out their sentence. Uh, so basically you have those who are convicted and those who are not convicted all being confined in these local facilities. Uh, in, the, in the film, uh, Rikers, an American jail, about New York's largest jail, 40% of, 80% uh, of the detainees, as they are called, uh, have not been tried, they have not been sentenced, they're awaiting either trial or uh, negotiated settlement. And, they, and some of them, usually they're out in a few months, but many have been held three to six years. Right. I might add that because of realignment, that there are now people who ordinarily would be serving longer than a year in prison, they're now serving them in jails. So the jails are actually becoming places that used to be, you'd serve maybe a year and now people are serving years in our jails. So, so speaking of the fact that it is a jail, uh, Bill, could you tell us how did you decide to make a film about this particular jail? Reports of brutality, atrocities, inhumanity at Rikers uh, were beginning to come out in exposés by some very talented and committed journalists in New York for the New York Times, for the New Yorker, for the uh, uh, New York Magazine. But all of them were told, filtered through the experience of the journalist because you, that's the way print journalism works. I wanted, to, I wanted to hear from the detainees themselves. I did some research, discovered no documentary had ever been done about Rikers or any other New York jail, which allowed the detainees, the inmates, to tell their story in their words of their lived experience. So. My team and I tracked down 100 former detainees, interviewed every one of them, chose 12 whose experiences could show us the arc of the experience, and, 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 and made sure we were doing a documentary that was representative of what was happening in many jails across the country. There was a study a survey a few years ago that ranked the 10 worst jails in the country. One of them was, Rockers was number 10, the Los Angeles jails, which is a system of eight jails, uh, were number five. Uh, so this is a universal problem, and I wanted to give Americans a chance to hear directly from the people most impacted. I had a motive. You know, in Rikers Island, it is, is an island between Queens and Manhattan. It's out of sight, out of mind. I went to see this play Tom Stoppard wrote called Night and Day. And in that play, the photographer, who's the protagonist, says people do terrible things to each other. It's worse when they do them in the dark. Now, I wanted to show, shed some light on what was happening at Rikers. We read about it. We had not experienced it. And the great value of television is the wedding of the word and the image. When they waltz together, when they dance together, when they are in sync with each other, you can cross the distance between you and someone else in an experience you have not, uh, that is not your experience, and you can suddenly see what the world looks like when you're standing in different shoes. The ancient Israelites had a great title for it, a great term for it, the science of the heart. Shakespeare summed it up when Lear on the heath says to Gloucester, how do you see the world? And Gloucester, who's blind, blind Gloucester replies, I see it feelingly. Not sentimentally, feelingly. I feel the experience of others, and that's what I wanted to do with this film. So really, the, the, the film is it, it, to be understood as not a problem that's just at Rikers, but problems across the country, and they seem to run the gamut from a broken system to unqualified personnel, to inhumane conditions, to particular challenges for women inmates, to inmates with mental illness, to the bail bond system, uh, and as you might expect, those without financial resources suffering more than anybody else. Let's start with the system that puts people in jail and then seems to leave them lingering there longer than intended. Lenore Anderson, can you start us off with some of the systemic problems? Sure. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much for making this incredible film, and I hope that uh, everyone uh, listening gets a chance to see it. I, these are the stories that need to be told, and uh, these uh, stories will lead to the transformation we need to see in this country around criminal justice reform, so thank you very much. 
uh, for sharing them. The uh, systematic problems, I, I think one thing that's really important to understand about uh, the state of uh, abuse in jails, uh, challenges in jails, overcrowded uh, human rights violations in jails, uh, is that this is a problem of our generation. This is a problem that uh, has grown. This is not how it has always been in the United States. This is not uh, something that we just are now uh, suddenly talking about. This is something that has grown exponentially in the last 20 or 30 years in this country and really happened um, under, uh, under most people's noses uh, under the guise of what was called the, the tough on crime era. So in that era, what happened in this country was we changed a whole whole bunch of laws. We changed state laws, we changed federal laws, and what those changes in law did was increase the number of people going into uh, the criminal justice system and lengthen the time that people are in the criminal justice system. Um, that led to a dramatic expansion uh, in, uh, in the bureaucracy that runs the criminal justice system in the number of jails and the number of prisons. We've seen a 700% growth in incarceration combined with uh, not just the number of people that's growing, but also the money being spent on incarceration in the United States. It's about $80 billion per year uh, that this country spends. And so when we talk about systematic problems at the jail level, um, we want to make sure that we're talking about that in context of how all of this is a current crisis uh, that needs to, uh, needs to be taken on. Um, when it comes to who goes into the jail, um, this is really a function of uh, uh, poverty, probably more than any other determinant. Um, and w w that uh, has uh, also uh, gotten worse and worse o over the years. Um, there's a couple of major uh, categories of people who are in jail. In California, 60% of the people who are in jail are there pre-trial. Um, they haven't been convicted of a crime. They're uh, waiting for their trials. The, most of those 60% can't afford to pay bail. Bail has been posted, uh, but our bail amount has been set, but they can't uh, post it. Um, another uh, a category of people that are in jail are uh, people who have violated their probation or parole terms, um, and so they would also uh, be in jail. But when you look at the s systematic problems that we have, um, a lot of it has been connected to this ratcheting up of punishment, ratcheting up of laws, and ratcheting up of uh, bail amounts, and ratcheting up of fines and fees that people can't pay, um, and then they end up being I incarcerated for those reasons. So, you know, we th you know, many people think we got rid of debtor's prisons a long time ago uh, in, in this country, but when you look in local jails, what we know is that's absolutely not true. Um, and what we need to do is start with reforming the law so that they're fair um, between uh, the wealthy and those who are impoverished um, so that we have a system that is not wealth-based and that alone would go a long way to reducing over-incarceration in the county jails. And that has to happen at the local level. Only about 13 percent of of the inmates of prisons, federal prisons, uh, of, of all of, of the 2.3 million uh, people incarcerated right now are federal prison, are federal prisoners. Most of them are at the county, local, uh, county and state. I wish I had been doing a documentary about one of your prisons here in California. It's, I think I'm pronouncing it right, Merced, uh, uh, down in the gateway to the Yosemite National Park. You may have read that there have been hunger strikes there as the inmates are protesting the uh, overcrowding Merced, the jail, the county jail there was built for 753 people. The last few years it's had up to 1,200, uh, 1,150 to 1,200. And the prisoners, as they did in many other uh, uh, cities around the country, Virginia, North Carolina, other places, went on a hunger strike. A man named Richard Castillo, who goes by the nickname of Noodles, has been four years in the Merced jail awaiting trial. He has not had due process yet. He's there arrested for <coughs> drug possession and a related assault. His eight-year-old, nine-year-old son, who was his son who was nine when he went in, is 13 now. And he is there because he could not afford, get this, he could not afford the monstrous bail of $650,000. His wife, who's still out raising the daughter, who's now four, and the son, who's now 13, went on a hunger strike with him. It's a classic story, rarely reported by a press that is shrinking in its interest to these subjects. It's a story that can be replicated, I can assure you, in every state in this union. 
as you said, Ms. Henderson, the burden of bail falls on the poor. In, their, in your, you're one, you're one of 28 states here in California that allow counties to to require the arrested to pay for their participation in the civil jury once they enter the uh, the criminal justice system. Children are required to pay in in your in some of your counties. They're required to pay for being part of the ju for entering the juvenile justice system, and it falls as you said on the poor. So what, what I'd also like to, to let people know that bail is literally there are bail schedules that are enacted by every county. And I'm just saying California. So I'm holding before you, this is the bail schedule just for misdemeanors out of Santa Clara County. So if you look at it and I just, everything's it's like $5,000, $10,000. They list all the offenses. For example, petty theft of a value not exceeding $50 bail. Five hundred dollars. Um, so, the, the bail schedule is accessible to anybody. You just go online, and who is it that sets bail? Judges, at the request of prosecutors. But judges set bail, and these schedules are just that. They are guidelines. And what we have been doing, and I, I say I'm part of that. When I was on the bench, was just mindlessly. Here's the schedule. Just issue the bail out. That has to change, and it's changing, because people are now speaking up and becoming educated and aware of what bail is. And of course, it's a big money-making machine for private, for insurance companies and for bail bond companies. It's a money maker, and that has to change. I'm sure you know that here in California, the bail, as in other states, but primarily here in California, we actually looked into doing some documentaries out here on this subject. The bail bond industry will actually find a way to reach inmates inside and hire them, pay them, bribe them to, uh, from inside, make sure that these poor people apply for bond and, and then sign the note, the 10% that goes to the bond, uh, the bond dealer, whatever you call him here. It's a corrupted industry. There's more corruption in the prison industry in this country than almost any other except Congress. KQ. <laughs> uh. so. One, one quick thing, KQED's uh, Suki Lewis, a reporter, did a fabulous yeah, yeah. report on bail capping in Santa Clara County. And I encourage you, go online, read this report. And it's indeed, it's a, it's a whole business where inmates are paid by bail bondsmen to be their agents inside to, uh, to basically run the whole system. So switching, switching gears slightly here, the Rikers documentary indicates that jail personnel and we have a number of questions from our audience here about this, can often be unqualified and poorly trained, uh, but also criminal in their behavior. And Judge Cordell recently headed a commission investigating the murder of an inmate by guards in the Santa Clara County Jail. We'd like to hear each of you weigh in on the issues with jail personnel, the work culture of jails, and what might be done to make things better. Uh, Bill, let's start with you. Well, I, I, I talk to these uh, men and women who are in the film, Rikers, which you can see Monday night on the KQED here, and they report, they are, inmates become brutal with each other. Inmates become brutal, toward, violent toward guards. Guards become violent toward inmates. It's a, it's a factory for crime and a factory for violence. It, it, it breeds violence. You will hear in the film, some of the witnesses say that the only way they could survive was to become violent to respond to the violence that was omnipresent in the environment with violence of their own. And there were young men who go in at 14, 16, 18, who come out uh, who never thought of violence. They were just trying to survive on the streets. They join gangs. They have to for survival. They come out as more seeking violence, as you will hear one of them say, to solve all their problems when they return to home, return to the streets, and the doors are closed constantly to them. So it's a breeding ground for the cruelty that produces violence. What do you find? I know you've worked with a lot of those people. You know, I, the, we, uh, we don't have a system that is built on uh, the notion that we're training people to reduce crime and violence, we're training people to advance public safety. In, instead, what most of our uh, correction systems revolve around is 
literally control, training for control. And so when you look at, um, you know, what are the requirements to, to become a guard? I know uh, the judge uh, can speak uh, to that. Yeah. What, what we find is that this is not um, an, a, a set of uh, 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 public systems in which uh, we, uh, you know, are uh, encouraging uh, best practices. We know a lot about how to stop crime and violence, whether it's through, uh, you know, prevention at the community level or uh, mental health treatment, drug treatment. Um, we certainly know a lot about what it would take uh, to turn uh, lives around when people are uh, removed from society. None of that is really driving our criminal justice system priorities. None of it is really uh, determining, uh, you know, the standards by which we uh, train people to become guards or to uh, really be even uh, in the in the criminal justice system as prosecutors or uh, uh, probation and the like. And so, really, what we have to ask ourselves is uh, what what is the best pathway to public safety and what does that look like in terms of the systems that uh, help us achieve it? We have the absolute opposite of that uh, in most of our uh, uh, criminal justice investments and you know, I think that there's an opportunity to turn it around now that uh, more people are uh, catching wind. Uh, I used to work with parents of incarcerated youth, right. um, and we, uh, uh, at the time, we were seeking to uh, close California's youth prisons. California used to have uh, over 11,000 young people incarcerated in these warehouse-style prisons in conditions markedly similar to what uh, you described in your film. We're talking, uh, you know, 12 to 18-year-olds. Um, and in um, the uh, advocacy, we would bring groups of parents uh, uh, up to the state capitol to advocate for alternatives to incarceration, advocate for for ending solitary confinement for uh, youth in the, in the youth state prisons. And at one point we decided to sit down with uh, some leadership from the guards, uh, from, the, from the prison guards uh, lobby, because of course that's a, a, an important voice uh, in criminal justice policy in the state. And one of the parents asked uh, the, uh, the guard that we were speaking with, the prison guard head that we were speaking with, um, do you have any children? He says, yes, four boys. Would, which one of them would you allow, if they got in trouble with the law, to go into the youth prison system? Not one. I would do everything I could to fight against that, that any of my children going into this system. And so until we start understanding that these are our kids, these are our family members, these are our community members going into these jails and prisons, um, and until we start relating to it as if we would do anything to protect them from human rights violations and harm, um, then we, uh, we haven't done enough to uh, advance criminal justice reform. Let me, let me give you just a quick snapshot of a jail. So let's talk Santa Clara County because I was a judge in the county and I was also chair of the commission that looked into jail operations after the murder of a mentally ill inmate, the jail. So on a, any given day in Santa Clara County, there are 634, and they're not called jail guards, they're correctional officers because it's the Department of Correction. And I will tell you, I don't think there's anything correct about any of it, <laughs> all right? So these correctional deputies, are, and this is for, I'm just talking Santa Clara County, which is standard for the state. Here's the requirement. To be a correctional deputy, you have to be at least 21 years old. You have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Now. That's all? That's it. Now, you have to pass tests. I mean, there's some physical stuff, but I'm just talking again about basic education. So high school diploma, GED, 21. Now. I just randomly picked four correctional deputies um, in Santa Clara County and looked at their salaries. So I picked one, his last name, and, and it's, I'm, I'm calling them out because this is public information. Your tax dollars pay for all of this. So a, a deputy's last name is S-A-N, San. In 2016, salary and benefits, $301,571. One person. One person, one year. All right, let me just give you a couple. Uh, Christopher Graham, $290,000, $989, one year. That's, that's salary and benefits. Again, high school diploma, GED. So I took that and I said, now let me look at a public school teacher. Yeah. No, seriously, in, in, in California. So I took uh, a, a very wealthy school district, took Palo Alto, a school psychologist, Bachelor's degrees, master, PhD, right? School psychologist in Palo Alto makes 100, salary and benefits, 
$176,000. If you take a classroom teacher in East Palo Alto, the Ravenswood School District, uh, and again, a requirement, by the way, for a teacher, just a classroom teacher, you have to have a bachelor's degree and you have to pass the credentialing exam. Classroom teacher, East Palo Alto, salary for Amy Nguyen, 20, in 2015, salary and benefits, $103,000. That's a bachelor's passing degree. So we, we, have, we need to, to know this information. If any of you go to transparentcalifornia.com, it has the salaries of every public employee in the state of California. In the film, you will hear the detainees at Rikers talk about how so many of the corrections officers come from their own neighborhoods, the low-income neighborhoods, and these are jobs that are promising to them. They don't make that much money uh, in, in New York, but, and, and they will express sympathy for one of them, one of the a young man in our film talks about how he was helped by a, a sympathetic corrections officer. Others will say how they get turned on by them because their job, you know, you're deprived of your liberty and you're put into the care of somebody who's got a uniform on and you know what that does uh, to a lot of human beings. We are human beings after all. But the corrections union uh, judge in New York has held up the reforms at Rikers for, for obstinate reasons and when this independent commission headed by the former chief uh, judge of the New Yorker Court of Appeals came out a month ago with its recommendation after a year's study that uh, Rikers be closed. The corrections guard laughed at it. The corrections union, according to the headline in the paper, laughed at it. On the issue of cost, it cost $208,000 for one bed in one year at Rikers, eight, I mean, sorry, $208,000 to keep one person in that bed, in that cell for one year. You can go to Harvard twice uh, for that. That's right. And we really have it screwed up in this country. Incarceration is a shame, a failure, and a scandal. It is wrong the way we're doing it. The Brennan Center for Justice, a very respected nonpartisan group at the New York University School of Law, came out with a study a few months ago, a five-year study of the best statisticians and criminologists and sociologists that said 39% of the people in our jails and prisons today do not need to be there. If you think that we lock people up, not just for punitive purposes, but for the safety of society, then these are not, these people, the 39% the Brennan Center talk about, are not a threat to society. They're nonviolent crimes, they're soft crimes, they're petty uh, crimes, and yet because of the bond and bail and and, and, and the, the, uh, the overwhelmed justice system in New York, they're held there indefinitely at that great uh, cost. It's just an atrocity right. and, and in just, the name of humanity. And just a comment about unions. I'm pro-union. I would never cross a picket line. But at the same time, you can understand why, for example, in California, the Correctional Officers Union will do everything they can yeah. to keep change from coming because look how much money they're making yeah. with a high school diploma. So, so these are huge obstacles. The, the unions that want to protect their interests, the bail industry that want to protect its interests. When you think about it, correctional officers, they make more money than judges in California. Amazing, right? L L Lenore, <clears throat> Lenore Anderson, women inmates seem to suffer disproportionately in jail. Why is that? What are the special problems that incarcerated women experience? Uh, well, so, you know, the percentage of uh, inmates that are uh, female is not, uh, it's a small percentage, but it's growing. It's one of the fastest growing uh, segments of the uh, jail and prison populations in the country is uh, our, our women and girls. And uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, experiences that women and girls have that are, are, un are, are distinct. Um, one of which is most of the women who are incarcerated have children. Um, and of m the women who are incarcerated with children, uh, most of them are the primary caregivers for those children. And so when we talk about the millions of children uh, who have incarcerated uh, parents, uh, we know that uh, the impact of incarcerating a, a mom is 
dramatic and uh, you know g the trauma that that causes the child is going to go on for uh, you know the rest of their lives and possibly their children's lives um, so you know it's really uh, important that we recognize um, that if we're taking uh, moms away from kids especially uh, when there are alternatives to incarceration that would work better uh, to uh, both reduce their recidivism but also protect and stabilize the family um, that's actually a choice for public safety. And instead of making a choice that would be good for public safety, we make one that's far worse uh, by uh, incarcerating uh, women, uh, especially women who, who, who care for children, and uh, destroying uh, you know, relationships uh, for generations to come. I, I will say a couple things that we found in California that, that are uh, important and promising. Um, when we uh, ran the Yes on Proposition 47 campaign uh, in 2014, uh, we uh, discovered that it was a disproportionate proportionate number of the people who would benefit from the law who uh, were women uh, because it was the low-level crimes, right? So Proposition 47 uh, is a ballot initiative that California voters passed in 2014 that took uh, six low-level crimes and mostly petty theft and drug possession and changed them from felony to misdemeanor. Um, what that means is you can no longer go to state prison and you no longer have the felony consequence hanging over you for the rest of your life, which can be extremely debilitating um, when it comes to housing jobs and, and all of that. Um, and so when we looked at the numbers in terms of who are uh, individuals who are being incarcerated for these uh, low-level crimes, what we found is uh, disproportionately it was actually poor women um, who were uh, serving time for uh, felony convictions related to these, uh, these lo lowest-level crimes, um, partly because uh, especially uh, women who are caregivers, um, if it's, it's oftentimes crimes connected to e economic instability um, when it comes to theft uh, or forgery or things like that, um, you know, and so those are, uh, when we incarcerate for these low-level crimes, it's particularly difficult uh, for uh, poor women to, uh, to recover from that. And so with the, we, the, the measure one, um, the, the prison and jail population in California has gone down by 15,000 people since it passed in, in 2014. An even bigger impact of Proposition 47 is that there's a million Californians uh, who are eligible to get an old felony conviction removed from their old criminal record as a result of uh, the passage of Proposition 47. We allowed for broad retroactivity so that we could really clean up that legacy of mass incarceration and go back and, and get some of those old felony convictions removed. And we've been doing, uh, you know, uh, record change fairs and trying to get out the word and let Californians know that they can get their old record changed under Proposition 47. And it's just been eye-watering uh, the stories of people coming and saying, you know, I haven't been able to get a, a full-time job for 10, 15 years as a result of having a felony conviction. Um, I haven't been able to get my child out of foster care. Um, I haven't been uh, able to uh, uh, get a loan or get any public assistance. Uh, you know, the felony Felony conviction is, is, is sort of uh, often the overlooked um, additional incarceration and additional time that people serve after, after release. And so when you're talking about uh, uh, women, especially women in poverty who are caretakers, um, that's a double, uh, a double punishment. You're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California program. We're discussing the problem of mass incarceration in America, and our guests are Bill Moyers, distinguished journalist and executive editor of the new documentary, Rikers, an American Jail, LaDoris Cordell, retired Superior Court judge and former chair of the Santa Clara County Jail Commission, and Lenore Anderson, founder and executive director of Californians for Safety and Justice. I'm John Boland, your moderator for the program. You can hear Commonwealth Club programs on the radio, catch up with the program videos on the club's YouTube channel, and find us on Twitter and Facebook. Bill Moyers, your documentary, uh, we learn that too often someone ends up in jail when he or she should be receiving treatment for mental illness. Why are we warehousing our mentally ill citizens in jails where they don't receive proper treatment and stay much longer than is intended in jail? Because we won't make the commitment of resources, time, money, talent, to finding a way to deal with the mentally ill in our midst. President Kennedy, whom I served, uh, thought he was doing the right thing in 1961 when he put an end to mental institutions. And since then, we have turned increasingly to the jails and the prisons to be the warehouses for the mentally ill. You will see a, you will see a scene in the movie in which a, a young man 
admits he and and describes his mental illness and uh, and uh, talks about it openly. But he, there was nowhere for him to go. We followed up and looked into it. There was nowhere for him to go in New York City for the treatment that he needed. So I don't know if that's true out here. But for, uh, one estimate I've seen is that 40 percent of the people in jail and prison need to be receiving treatment somewhere else for mental illness. And so do the people who are there for addiction and alcoholism. There's an alternative to prison for those. I know this because my son, who was an addict, is very active. One of my sons is very active in the field of, of, of treatment. And he just cannot believe that we send people like him. He never had to go because, quite frankly, I could hire a lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but he never had to go. He's given his life now to working on this issue. And uh, he just does not understand why we keep sending addicts and alcoholics who are suffering from a disease into this system. What did you find about that? So, again, my experience is limited to right here in California, and specifically Santa Clara County. I previously told you that a mentally ill inmate was beaten to death uh, on the psych ward at the jail in Santa Clara County. Three uh, correctional deputies are on trial now for his murder. Uh, so our jails, not just in California, have become the place where people who need mental health, mental health treatment that's where we end up in the society. That's completely wrong. I mean, just think about it. Go to jail, and who, who are the deputies who have high school diplomas, and we're going to have those who are mentally ill treated in these places? Outrageous. But, you know, it stems not, we, we have responsibility, that is the public, but we have to look at our legislatures here in California and Sacramento. Who is passing these laws? Who is it that is, and these are our representatives. So I, I believe it's on us. I especially, it's on, I believe, judges who are now presiding, retired, to speak up about this because we are part of the conduit that sends these people there. So we need to rethink all of this stuff, particularly when it comes to the mentally ill. And indeed, yes, most of the jail populations, I'd say most, have, uh, in, the inmates have some mental health issues that need to be addressed, but not in a jail setting. You will see in the film, which you can see Monday night on KQED. That's right. You've taught me how to do that, John. Uh, 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 you know, look at the moon. Oh, this will be seen Monday night. Uh, you will see a scene in which a corrections officer is leading a young man who's handcuffed, uh, or his hands are in a, a, a suit, a, a confining suit, leading him down the walkway of a, of, a, of a tier. And suddenly, the corrections officer hits him, knocks him to the ground, and falls on him and starts pounding him. Other guards come to help. That young man, uh, until this happened, until the story I'm about to tell you happened, uh, despite the reports I mentioned about the exposés of Rikers, that nothing had penetrated the consciousness of, 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 of New York at large. This story did when a remarkable reporter uh, turned this story of this young man into a major and moving and powerful piece in New Yorker magazine. His name was Khalif Browder. He was arrested at age 17 for the alleged theft of a backpack and an argument that grew up around it. He was sent to Rikers, not tried, didn't get a trial. He spent three years there uh, without due process. He was held for trial or plea bargaining. When he was there, he was sent to solitary confinement uh, where he was brutalized by guards. When he got out, this is all documented, when he got out, uh, of, of solitary confinement, he went back to his cell and, 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 and spent the last year of the three years. He got out, and a year after he got out, he t committed suicide. He had tried to commit suicide in the prison, in the jail, which is why they took him to solitary confinement and punished him for trying to commit suicide. When he got back out, he managed to stay until the end, and then he took his life. I mean, you tell me what environment uh, what kind of environment you think that is. And I know it exists in other jails and prisons around the country. What did you, may I ask a question? When you were wrestling with sentencing, how would you, what did you, what, how did you deal with the conflict that you obviously felt at times or the, the weight of what you were deciding to do? Well, I'm glad you asked me because I'm actually working on a memoir about my 20 years of judging to talk about this. Um, Sentencing is perhaps the most difficult thing I think that judges do because we have to decide 
what happens to this person who has now been convicted or who has taken advantage of a plea bargain, which means they may not be guilty at all, but because they just want to get out, have gone ahead and taken a plea bargain. And that's a whole other discussion, by the way, which I think is terribly ruining our system, the plea bargain system. So when you asked me, it was, it was very difficult. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons I decided to leave the bench uh, was because I was required to sentence many people under California's antiquated three strikes law. It has now been changed somewhat to be made better. Um, but as a judge, we take an oath to uphold the law. Sentencing also, though, involves some subjectivity. And that's why it's so important to have a diverse judiciary so that we get the people who come before us and we don't just stereotype everyone who comes into our courts. So in, in, in a word, it's just very difficult. I wrestled with this and to this day, to this very day, um, I think about things that maybe I could have done, or should have done differently. Um, there is, by the way, for judges, at least in California, all that happens is one day, if you just, you're appointed or you run for election, you're a judge. There is no specific training at all. So a doctor has to go to medical school and then you do your residency and then you intern. Judges, we don't do that, right? Go to law school, you practice law minimum of 10 years. So you could never enter a courtroom for 10 years and do transactional contracts and the next day you're a judge. Having to make decisions about people's lives. So there's a lot that needs to be done. It's hard for me to just answer your question in one word, but it, it is a very difficult thing and, I'm, and it, it's just, the, one of the reasons why we have so many people in is because of what we do and the black robes and you know, what, the sentences we impose. We have a, a number of questions from the audience on this subject of sentencing, both in terms, and I'd like each of you to uh, address it, uh, both in terms of the kinds of sentencing reform that may be possible or is underway, but also specific questions about the uh, changes that Attorney General Jeff Sessions is making in terms of federal sentencing. Uh, the impact that that will have. Mm -hmm. um, so the, we need to change our sentencing laws, and uh, luckily, uh, a lot of states recognize that. I think you know we're at a, a tipping point moment on criminal justice reform in this country, and it's a very exciting time uh, to be uh, taking action to to change the laws. I would say there's uh, sort of three major categories of sentencing law changes that uh, need to be made uh, to to uh, rein in uh, mass incarceration and, and replace it with uh, smart approaches to safety. Um, one is that we have way too many uh, 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 felonies and we have way too many uh, uh, mandatory incarceration uh, uh, schemes for some of the low-level uh, uh, crimes for which people uh, can end up cycling in and out of the justice system. So, you know, part of the reason we looked to reduce uh, low-level crimes uh, from felonies to misdemeanors was to right-size the, pe the punishment of uh, for those level, low-level crimes uh, with something that's more in alignment with what the public wants, which is, yes, being held accountable is appropriate, but no, we don't need to waste a jail or a prison bed on this low-level crime. We can uh, do restorative justice or uh, community service and the like and, and handle the low-level crime. So we need to stop the mandatory incarceration and the mandatory felony uh, for so much of the low levels. Um, for more serious offenses, uh, the realities are uh, we incarcerate people for extraordinary amounts of time. and as you can see uh, from the film, make matters a lot worse. Uh, people uh, are, uh, uh, ex there's some people who in criminology today who will say the incarceration environment is actually a criminogenic environment. In other words, an environment that makes it more likely that you're going to be unstable and uh, it it find it difficult to stay out of uh, the cycle of recidivism if you're, if you're incarcerated for a really long time. All of that length of time is all these mandatory sentencing laws that uh, uh, emerged in the 80s and 90s. Truth in sentencing, uh, three strikes and you're out, automatic transfer of juveniles into adult prison, all of these sort of uh, legislated mandates um, make it impossible for judges to make rational decisions based on the circumstances of the individual's life and what would be most likely to stop that person from uh, committing a crime in the future. Um, so we've got to get rid of those mandatory sentences uh, that are uh, bad for public safety for, for, for all uh, categories 
uh, of crime. And then the third thing is that when we talk about um, once people have served their time uh, or once people have completed their probation sentence, what happens um, after that? And I think we need to uh, be very clear that you know, in, in places like California, it's like $250 in a bus ticket or something like that that is about the total sum, you know, sum total of your re-entry uh, from, from state prison and just how um, unhelpful and un unhealthy that is. Um, and one of the things that w is so exciting is these reforms are happening. Um, you know, Proposition 47 was one of four ballot initiatives um, that California has uh, uh, enacted to uh, reduce over-incarceration just in this state alone. Um, we've seen Republican governors um, in you know, places like Georgia um, actually go to the legislature and negotiate with the legislature to reduce mandatory sentencing, to reduce the number of felonies, um, that we just got a piece of legislation that we were supporting um, in Illinois. Uh, there was a piece of legislation that was signed by, came out of the Democratic uh, uh, legislature, signed by the Republican governor, Neighborhood Safety Act, to reduce incarceration in that state. So this is, despite what the new administration thinks they're going to do, the train has already left the station on criminal justice reform. Yes. Right. That is what's happening in this country. So if I could say just a word about Mr. Sessions. Um, <laughs> thankfully, his jurisdiction extends only to the federal system uh, because the states, um, many of them are ignoring his, what he has given the mandate to his federal prosecutors. Um, he is doing exactly what will result again in more mass incarceration. He knows it and he's good with it. Uh, the states are not, so thank goodness for that. Uh, so, you know, my, my only thing is that I, I am just grateful that there are, the states are taking the stand that we have taken, California and other states, to say that we are going to continue with this trend of reform, even though under the feds, uh, it's not happening. One other thing that the federal government has done under the uh, uh, Obama administration for eight years, the Justice Department was out investigating jails. Uh, at one point, there were at least 19, I counted recently, 19 consent decrees that the Obama administration was able to get from jails everywhere from, from uh, uh, Ohio, Alabama, California. These are the jails. I'm not even talking the prisons. My concern is, and I think we can all expect it, that we're not going to be seeing those kinds of consent decrees coming out of this administration from this Justice Department. Well, there's another uh, uh, reality to fit into that. Uh, as you know, the Obama administration began to withdraw uh, support and funding for privatized prisons. Uh, they, did it, they did it on the basis of some studies that showed Although there wasn't a major difference, there was a difference in the level of abuse in privatized prisons and those of public prisons. And expecting that Hillary Clinton was going to be elected on election day, the stocks of the two largest privatized prison industry companies were, had tanked they, because they figured President Clinton would continue the withdrawal from privatized prisons of uh, the federal government. The day after the election, and you know what happened on the election, I think most of you probably do. Uh, the day after the election, one of those stocks went up 140% and the other went up 90% on the anticipation that uh, there would be new contracts, new beds, new, uh, de uh, new uniforms, new uh, 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 incarceration centers, particularly for immigrants. Uh, and that happened, and today those uh, companies are doing quite well. There are three things in this country that should never be privatized. That is, they should never be done for a profit, quite frankly. One is the military. It should not be a profit-making industry. Two are public schools. They should never be a profit-making industry. And third are prisons. You should never pay someone to do what we should be doing as a democratic society. That's right. Uh, Amen to that. We wouldn't want to conclude without talking about bail bond reform. And I think just understanding what is the problem with the current bail system and what are the reforms that are, that are coming forward, Judge sure. Cordell. So we all know bail. Bail is basically collateral. It's to secure your return to court 
that you will show up. That's really what it's all about. So to, to make sure there's no risk, we'll say pay some money. And that's where you have these bail bond companies come in. And it's up to judges, judges who decide who gets out on bail. Nobody else. We get advice from prosecutors and from the defense side, but it's on judges. And judges have this bail schedule. And so it's kind of almost been happening mindlessly where bail is being set. And it's just here, here's the schedule, $500. Most folks, most people cannot afford the bail. And so, but the issue becomes, are they really a, a risk? Are they not gonna come back to court? And that just has not been explored. It hasn't been really thought about. Now we are. So there are now jurisdictions all through the country, including here in California, that where they're saying, you know what? Either, sometimes we just need to do away with bail entirely. So of course we have the bail bond industry rising up. They're very upset. Just do away with it. So, because most people will come back and those who don't, the judges will issue a warrant and the person will be arrested. Now, there are all kinds of different uh, forms of reforming in the bail uh, system. So I'm not familiar with specific things, but one idea is just get, just do away with this whole concept. Um, I think we are one of two countries, I think it's true in the Philippines and here, the only ones that allow these private bail bond companies to make money. It is, it's illegal everywhere else. And there's a big movement here in California to uh, drastically reduce the use of money bail, and it's an exciting time uh, to uh, get involved in this issue in the state. There are two pieces of legislation that's been introduced this legislative session as we speak, um, one from Senator Hertzberg uh, in the Senate, another from Assemblymember Bonta um, in the Assembly. Um, they're identical bills, um, and they replace, uh, largely replace the use of money bail with uh, what's called pre-trial uh, release programs. And these are programs where uh, you have an independent pre-trial agency um, that determines uh, the level of supervision you need and uh, supervises you uh, during the time that you're waiting for uh, your trial. These are uh, excellent programs that have a great track record of success and allow for stability and family uh, uh, unity uh, during a, a, a really difficult and distressful time. Um, so uh, those two bills are uh, being heard uh, probably uh, uh, today and, and, and this week, and uh, they definitely need a lot of help um, in getting passed and getting signed to the gov uh, and getting to the governor's uh, desk for signature. Um, and that would be a sweeping change for uh, California. New Jersey uh, just recently uh, passed a sweeping piece of legislation to uh, replace the use of money bail with pretrial programs. Um, that got implemented this year, um, and it's been remarkable. There's only been, I think, eight people for whom bail has been sent in the state uh, uh, set in the in the state of New Jersey since it passed in the beginning of uh, January. Um, uh, the Washington, D.C. is a jurisdiction that does not have uh, money bail. States like Colorado and Kentucky, um, there's a lot of action right now happening, and it's a great, and it's a great uh, time to get involved. Uh, bail Reform CA is a website you can go to uh, to check out more information on the California wow. campaign. Start locally. The, so many of the issues we face as a country are national and international in scope, and it's hard for anybody to get a hold of it, and they therefore become very despairing and very frustrated. But you can start locally on criminal justice reform and with, with people like this and others uh, and, and really make a difference. Are there other, there, there are definitely suggestions from the audience, people want to do something. And so what are some of the other steps that citizens can take? Well, by the way, there, I'm told by three or four people since I've been out here about the very good program at San Quentin, not the uh, death chamber, but uh, the very good program of education that is going on there. A lot of, uh, of, of activity in that regard, and it has a good bit of citizen support, I say, and, in, and prison uh, uh, support, too. And you should look into that and uh, make that a kind of model if it's what I am told by friends I respect out here uh, is possible. Uh, the other things I think w we should be doing is that you all, all those listening, all those here, should organize groups that can watch this film. Um, get this documentary out there, and at schools, churches, synagogues, temples, wherever, get this out. Um, um, so that's one, because it, it, it has to motivate you. You cannot watch this documentary and walk out thinking, oh, uh, there's nothing else I need to do. Absolutely not. It, it is indeed a motivator. Uh, another is, you know, join, make this a part of the resistance. Um, you know, contact people in, in Sacramento here in California. Uh, 
and know who your representatives are and say, look, on bail reform, you make sure you vote for this. If not, you know, you, you come up for re-election and you know, we're gonna remember this. So uh, there, there are so many things we can do just by picking up the phone to keep this momentum going. And j just, uh, you mentioned a couple of other uh, efforts that uh, are opportunities. Um, one is that uh, you can go to closerikers.org to find out more information about the Close Rikers uh, campaign, uh, Just Leadership USA, uh, remarkable organization that's been working uh, intensely to advance uh, some of the reforms that are now happening. And uh, that's a campaign that de definitely needs support. Uh, you know, we, our, our, our organization uh, is one of about a dozen organizations here in California and uh, many dozens acro across the country um, that, are, that are working to reform state laws. Um, and all all of those organizations uh, need support and help. And, and I would also uh, just add that um, one of the things that is so critical in the conversation around criminal justice is really making sure that uh, when you're out there talking to people that we really ask the question, how are we gonna get to safety? One of the most sinister uh, sort of uh, realities of what has happened under mass incarceration is that that all of that expenditure, all of that, um, all of those violations, all of that, um, you know, racialized uh, 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 over incarceration policies were done in the name of public safety. They were done on the behalf of taxpayers um, in the name of public safety. And um, that is um, a myth that needs to be busted. This is not a choice between uh, civil rights versus public safety. This is not a choice between reduced incarceration versus public safety. This is actually a movement about building a new vision for safety. That's what uh, we really need to do uh, to make sure that we not only reduce over incarceration, uh, but actually replace it and replace it with the kind of investments um, that communities have, uh, of, have long overdue not had. Um, and so, you know, part of what we do is we talk to crime victims and we spend a lot of time trying to elevate the voices of those who've been directly impacted by crime and violence. And what we find time and again is that those are um, the unlikely allies that we need to bring into the conversation and partner with to come up with the safety solutions that are gonna make a difference. Um, you know, we found, uh, you know, by two to one margin, that diverse crime survivors from across the country um, want to see investments into to mental health and drug treatment and trauma recovery instead of more money for prisons and jails. That's what crime victims want. And so if we um, can start to put a, the voices together to build a new safety movement that can uh, you know, put forth uh, the, the kinds of policies that will make sure that we never see this again, um, then I think that we'll be on a, on a good pathway to uh, reforming the system. You know, the other thing though that we need to, do, to know to, to make change is to, we must know our history and too few of us know it and I just want to give you a, just a little tidbit of it just 30 seconds worth Lyndon Johnson 1967 created a president's commission on law enforcement and administration of justice and it was a body of 19 advisors appointed to study among other things the conditions uh, about incarceration they came out with a report in 1967, and it's called The Challenge of Crime in a Free Society. But listen what they said. This is just one sentence from it. Life in many institutions, talking jails, prisons, is at best barren and futile, at worst unspeakably brutal and degrading. The conditions in which they live are the poorest possible preparation for their successful re-entry into society and often merely reinforce in them a pattern of manipulation and destructiveness. So of course they recommended a complete change in the forms of incarceration. 1967, look where we are 50 years later. Unfortunately, we're getting near the end of our time. Bill Moyers, uh, would you like to wrap up with any closing comments on the, the documentary? As I was preparing the documentary, I reread Ursula Le Guin's story about the people of Omalas. Have you ever heard that story? Oma, uh, Ursula Le Guin lives in the San Francisco area. She's one of our wonderful fiction writers, and she wrote was great at short stories, and she wrote one about Omalas, a fictional town, uh, a utopian town overlooking the shimmering sea. Uh, when the story opens, there's a summer festival, everyone's having a great time, kites and games and races and senior citizens holding hands and children playing, and everyone, however, who's above adolescence knows that below the 
ground is a child in a cage who is required to stay there as a reminder of the injustice of justice and the preciousness of, of, of happiness. The citizens all know about it if you're over adolescence. You can even go in and peek at the child, but you cannot say a word to the child. And if you say a kind word to the child, you're really in trouble. A lot of people go and look and leave the town forever. Everyone else stays. They lead a prosperous life. They, they're always aware of the child, but they disregard the reality that their prosperity depends upon the caging of a child. Wow. Their prosperity depends upon the suffering of a child. Makes you think of slavery. Makes you think of the servitude of women. Makes you think that we are an exceptional country, a city on a shining hill. Until the light shines on those who are marginalized, lost, poor, sick, and in despair, until that light falls on the child in the cage, the prisoners in our jails and prisons, we cannot claim to be exceptional. Amen. It's up to Amen. you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks to our panelists, Bill Moyers, distinguished journalist and executive editor of the new documentary, Rikers in American Jail, LaDoris Cordell, retired Superior Court judge and former chair of the Santa Clara County Jail Commission, and Lenore Anderson, founder and executive director of Californians for Safety and Justice. We also thank our audiences here and on the radio, television, and the internet. We also want to remind everyone that you can see the documentary Rikers in American Jail online at rikersfilm.org or on your local PBS station. I'm John Boland, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.